Thank you so much, Gord. And thank you to uh, Amanda Hillis and Jim DeHoop from the BSB planning team also for joining us here this evening. Um, so I just wanted to just say a hearty thank you for joining us during spring break. Um, as a parent of two teens uh, at BSB high schools, I know that this is a challenging time for all of us. And so just really to honor and thank you for your participation tonight. And so we're just going to run through a little bit of a a run of show. I also just wanted to take a quick opportunity to introduce my colleagues. Um, we have Beverly White, who is here from our planning team. We have Stina Hansen, who is our child and youth planner on the Vancouver plan. Catherine Neal, who is uh, on the a public dialogue team. And Susan Hade, who is the deputy director of strategic planning and long range planning at the city of Vancouver. So we're here to uh, listen and learn with you. And uh, we're really looking forward to this evening. So just going forward here, do you know what's interesting is when we record our slideshow, it's often hard to advance. So I first wanted to just say, offer um, a land acknowledgement on behalf of our team in the city of Vancouver. And just to acknowledge that we are on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil First Nations. And that these lands are uh, the foundation of thousands of millennia of years of living the living culture of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge the Tunkaminam and Squamish as the original languages. And I just wanted to take a moment just to say that, uh, you know, one of the great honors of being part of this plan and what's happening at City of Vancouver right now is that there is a uh, an honest and authentic opportunity that we're trying to extend to change how we operate when it comes to um, how settlers and settler governments work with uh, First Nations governments. So we are really trying through our process to find new ways um, to, and, and even through failures and not doing everything right, to really try to uh, learn how we can do things differently going forward. And particularly thinking in terms of long range thinking, um, really uh, instead of doing a lot of the talking, starting to do more listening and learning uh, with our First Nations partners, as well as with urban Indigenous partners with whom we're also partnering. So just wanted to say that and to say that we're continuing to learn, fail, learn, and try to do better. So going forward, just wanted to tell you tonight that um, we're going to try and keep it to a tight two hours. We want to make sure we can release you into this uh, St. Patrick's Day evening. Um, so we're just going to uh, just give you kind of a quick overview. We're going to give a 30 minute presentation. We realize it's quite long, but we really want to tell you what we've been up to. The last time we met with you was a, a little over a year ago. Uh, we came very, very early in the process, really before we launched. And so we want to come back. Uh, acknowledging many of the things that were shared at that meeting and sort of the way forward over the coming months. Um, we want to have a plenary call for a plenary conversation that will moderate to allow all of you to ask questions in the group, to listen to each other, and for us to try to respond where we can, um, but also for us to catalog those questions where we can answer them and come back to you. We want to take a bio break at eight. We're going to try and really hold to that and take, give everyone five minutes to uh, do everything they need to do, or as I may need to tend to my teens in the background. And then uh, really, we're going to break into small group sessions and really sort of dig into your particular ideas and concerns uh, in terms of what we're framing. And finally, we're going to try and keep it really tight. We'll each sort of report back high level what we heard, but we're really going to be trying to document everything we've heard over this conversation. So we want to share what we've learned today, tonight. We really want to get advice on the goals that are sort of the, the scene, the, the scene setter or pace setter for the for the Vancouver plan process and really some ideas for achieving those goals from you. So just wondering right now, just to, to indulge us uh, in the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, um, you know, we'd love to do an icebreaker, but we would love it if in the chat right now, you could take a moment just to um, share your name and the name of the school that um, the, the children in your life uh, attend or the school catchment or the neighborhood where you're, where you see yourself or, or uh, see yourself as representing tonight. That'd be super helpful. And Amanda, uh, just to um, re remind people as well that we are recording the session. Yes, we're recording the session really um, so that we can share this as well with others who are not able to make it tonight. So just wanting to let you know that and um, that is the only reason that we would be doing that. We won't be sharing in the break or recording in the breakouts. We will just be recording those, um, uh, taking notes during those sessions. 
So just also to let you know that we, how we're going to use your input today, we're really committed to um, this input is going to really help us uh, shape and uh, refine uh, our way forward. Uh, but we are committed to providing the notes from tonight's meeting in the next two weeks and we will get back to you with that and give you an opportunity to see that. We're also going to be uploading this presentation to our website so that if you want others to have a look at it uh, or, do, or can't attend tonight that they will be able to respond or get some of the same information. So just to, we're going to give you a high level background. I'm going to turn it over to Susan Hay to give you uh, kind of the high level context for the Vancouver mm -hmm. plan. Great. Can uh, I just want to check if you can all hear me? Yes. Good. 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 Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. We're our team is really pleased to be here with you tonight. And um, as Amanda mentioned, it was just over a year ago that we were at the VSB office um, in the early launch stage and meeting with you in person. So um, really glad to connect, and I hope uh, I hope we do this uh, a whole bunch of times between now and. Um, completion of the plan in 2022. Um, as Amanda mentioned, my role is Deputy Director of Planning for Long Range and Strategic Planning. And so the Vancouver Plan Project um, is within my group um, and it's really uh, where we're coordinating the plan. But just to really emphasize that the Vancouver Plan is involving all of our departments um, at the city and uh, a very robust engagement plan that um, we're really trying to advance during the pandemic. Um, I also just wanted to pick up on uh, Gord Lau's great intro and a big goal for us in this engagement process is to really connect with um, VSB, with um, school communities on long range planning to ensure that we really do have a robust long range plan for the city. So just uh, really briefly, we're at a real key moment um, in, in planning for Vancouver. Um, city of Vancouver is surprisingly the only city in the metro region that doesn't currently have uh, a long range citywide plan. And the last time citywide planning was undertaken was when city plan was developed, um, which was completed in 1995. And it led to a number of uh, community visions um, in neighborhood areas. And so the current council, uh, which came into office in 2018, their first unanimous motion was to develop um, a citywide plan. And they approved a program uh, and a scope of work in July of 2019. And I just wanna highlight that we have been adjusting that scope of work due to the pandemic both from a budgetary perspective and also um, just a reality of scope given our abilities to engage. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna just talk briefly a little bit on what a citywide plan is, but this diagram really shows the desired state of where a Vancouver citywide plan would sit amongst our our planning framework. So currently, Vancouver has a whole bunch of citywide strategies, um, things like Greenest City Action Plan, the Transportation Plan, our Housing Strategy. We have a lot of area plans. Um, you might be familiar with the Camby Plan, the Marpole Plan, the West End Plan, um, East Fraser Lands Official Development Plan. Um, but we do not have uh, a cohesive citywide plan that really um, pulls these together, aligns these and looks to the long-term future. We're one of 21 member municipalities within the Metro region, and we are um, uh, a partner in the regional growth strategy as well. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, what is um, the, the Vancouver plan? What is uh, our citywide plan going to include? So first and foremost, a common vision. And um, again, that can sound kind of light and fluffy, but we really see the need for a robust, informed, long range vision that um, is very much informed by the, the kind of future we want and addresses the current issues that we face. So some of the, the components of the plan, if you imagine some of the chapters of the plan, we see a strategic policy framework. So policies that relate to 
um, social, environmental, economic, cultural areas. So we would see, for example, housing policies, environmental policies on green space, transportation, really that all of, um, all of the policy areas that make up sustainable communities. We see a, a structure plan or what uh, you might consider a high level land use plan. And again, Vancouver is really the only city that doesn't have its own um, cohesive land use plan or high level land use plan. Um, another key part uh, that we are developing as part of the Vancouver plan is a public investment framework. And so when we think about, for example, um, transportation, uh, infrastructure, community amenities, um, it, all of those things in terms of prioritization of funding and partners, which is another key part of the plan to implement that in a strategic way, knowing that we, we can't get everything on the list. So how do we be really strategic in our long-term financing of, of our growth management? Just some other components include uh, metrics. So a really good system of ongoing monitoring and adapting the plan, how are we doing, adjusting it. I mentioned partnerships and also um, with the pandemic, we pivoted the planning process so that we are also including short-term recovery actions. Next, please. So the planning process um, in a nutshell is a four step uh, or four phase process over a three year time horizon. So our first phase of planning, which was undertaken in 2020, is uh, called Listen and Learn. Amanda will highlight some of the outcomes of that, really listening to the community on key issues and um, key interests and opportunities. We're currently in the phase two, developing a vision and strategic directions, um, which again is working with all, um, all levels of community um, to develop that long-term vision and to also develop what sometimes we think of as, as the big moves, the big directions to get there. So part of that we're gonna talk about tonight. We see a major point um, in the fall of 2021 where we will be um, really undertaking um, engagement around a choices forum to develop um, a draft strategic framework. So really looking at options and choices and trade-offs for major policy directions. And then in 2022, we anticipate a, a draft plan in early 22, excuse me, early 2022, and then going through um, rounds of consultation and um, revisions to develop a proposed plan to deliver to council for its consideration in July of 2022. And we certainly see, um, you know, this is not a short term do a plan and it's done, it's on the shelf. It will involve years of uh, deeper implementation and action planning. Next slide, please. So over to Amanda. So we're going to do just a high level summary. A lot of this in very in detail is available on the project website, vancouverplan.ca. So we don't we don't want to gloss over it, but we want to give you that the big the, the big finding. So um, after a, really an intensive period of initial engagement that that followed the period when we met with you last, um, we heard from uh, overall about twelve thousand. Uh, distinct touch points, various folks, uh, whether through in-person uh, workshops, uh, whether through uh, participation in a survey, dozens and dozens of meetings with community. Um, we asked people uh, some key questions. Um, some were really um, open-ended about what is making your life difficult in Vancouver, what gives you joy. But one of the most telling things that we heard was that for a majority of Vancouverites, um, tracked against sort of census data, um, we heard that life is getting worse. And so we really learned that there are six core challenges. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, this in more detail as we go into our discussion of the goals. But this, these will not come as a surprise to you. Rising unaffordability, housing insecurity, widening and deepening inequality, 
um, visible public struggle, which people identified um, in different ways as a kind of an observation around the connections between homelessness, addiction, and mental health impacts, um, the need for more accessible and efficient transportation throughout the city, and really eroding trust and confidence in local government. We also ask people what they value, what they love, what gives them joy. And across the board, really um, surprisingly, people talk about their love of natural green spaces, places to rest, waterfront, forest, um, that these were things that people value greatly and give them enormous joy. Um, and also the places where they connect with others. Um, the idea of compactness, we, we did uh, a fair bit of engagement uh, in the early spring last year, sort of once the city um, re-engaged the public around uh, in this post-COVID era, folks were really struggling. And um, it was really challenging um, for many people were, you know, dealing with strong, strong impacts for their lives, but other folks were also thinking about how they live differently and finding ways that it became clear that having things more accessible in a small space um, or in a, within a smaller sort of range within their communities became increasingly valuable to them. And then this idea of an opportunity gap um, that there people observe that there should be more opportunities for more folks. And this idea of a core value of fairness was absolutely overwhelming. So, you know, again, I mentioned that we, we had surveys, meetings. We actually did an analysis of five years of public engagement findings so that we really honored the work that many folks had done with us. And we also made a strong, strong commitment and council asked us to do this and staff committed to this of putting equity at the center of our work. So we've tried, as I mentioned in land acknowledgement and through partnerships, um, new ways of working with Indigenous government um, and community organizations and really finding ways to um, allow community and support community to lead. Um, and then we really, um, you know, I think felt that um, what we needed to do was set the scene for future work. So we developed a series of goals that came not only through this community input, but also through very robust policy and trends analysis that our policy team was doing, as well as council priorities. So we're gonna share these goals with you and we're really interested in sort of getting your take on them. We're, we're also interested in sort of digging into how to achieve those goals as well. So these 10 goals, um, you know, they may seem very high level, but they really are rooted in both analysis and what we heard from folks. So really a priority, both of this council and we saw again through recent motions around um, UN DRIP and the connection to um, um, indigenous sort of uh, justice that to advance a city of reconciliation through decolonization was a core um, goal for the plan uh, to create an equitable, diverse and inclusive community. Again, another core goal that again emerged out of what we heard in terms of the desire for many to, to seek greater equity and fairness across the city. Um, to become a sustainable carbon neutral city, to address the challenges we have ahead of us in terms of climate, um, and also to become a more sustainable innovative city in that way. Um, and also we're prepared, safe and resilient. We heard lots of conversations about um, ensuring that we're safe as a city. And we have a lot of research and a lot of data. And in fact, our very recent resilient city strategy that looks at how we prepare for the shocks and stresses to come. Um, affordability, as we noted, was absolutely key. And in council, in fact, refined this goal when we presented it to them in October. So really to try to um, define uh, what that would mean in terms of affordability for each household. Um, to, just, to support a diverse and healthy economy, absolutely key to achieving these goals as well, in many ways, the bedrock of that. Um, and again, back to this idea of more connected, um, compact communities. You've maybe heard things about the five minute or 15 minute city. This again is another a goal for this plan. Um, to reestablish thriving urban natural systems, again, a, a joyful and a powerful connector for many Vancouverites, but also a way to address again, some of the challenges we have ahead. Um, to really think regionally, you know, and, and we've heard this again across the board that how do we work where we are a, a one city amongst many municipalities, um, and so how do we work to align? And so uh, our teams uh, are often working with Metrovan, with TransLink, with other municipalities, with the province, and how critical that is to the success of our planning efforts. And finally, you know, addressing this idea of, of a trust gap. 
How do we demonstrate transparency in our decision making? How do we improve the way we engage? And how do we um, look at how we partner with others? So this whole idea of how we operate in the world is absolutely key, these goals. Now we've tested these goals. Um, council asked us to go and to ensure that they were in alignment. And so using our, um, we have a new digital platform called Shape Your City. And we have our usual sort of polling tools, but we really heard that a majority of the folks of a, a, a group, a small test group of about 1600 felt this was important, uh, that, that, that they, were, they were supportive of these provisional goals. Um, uh, interestingly, they ranked uh, transparency as one of the top goals and affordability, which will not come as a surprise to many of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan. There have been other ways we've been testing these goals as well. And this, this evening is one another way we're doing that, but uh, Susan's going to share some of the policy research that is also informing our next steps on the plan. Great, thanks Amanda. So I'm just gonna very quickly skim through um, a number of, of maps primarily that um, are part of our analysis and really begin to tell the story of what's going on in the city, what may be going on in, in your neighborhood or other neighborhoods. And it, it starts to lead to um, a case for creating uh, a more equitable city. So this may be just something you want to think about as um, when you're in your breakout groups and how it relates to your area. So just um, in terms of regional context, um, we're really at a great moment where we're undertaking the Vancouver plan and at the same time, Metro Vancouver region is updating the regional growth strategy and TransLink is updating the uh, long range transportation plan. So it's, it's almost like a series of nesting Russian, Russian dolls. But um, while we think Vancouver uh, in our planning, we are very much uh, not an island and we are part of the region. So overall, we have um, about uh, a quarter of the total population, about 30% of the dwelling units or homes, and about um, almost 35% of, of the jobs. So a big player in the regional economy, just for context. Next, please. So the, the first citywide plan for Vancouver was the Bartholomew plan, which was um, developed in uh, 1927, 1928. And I'm just providing this as, as a bit of a reference because some of the key elements of the plan included really valuing um, single family neighborhoods and um, the, the sort of light areas of this map that you see um, are the majority area of the city. And at the time they were very much separated from apartment areas, um, industrial areas and also commercial areas. And with some of that separation, there was also um, policies that um, emerged around racial separation and also less investment going to, for example, apartment areas. And so this, this kind of um, high value and protection around single family areas has had a strong influence in our planning historically. And it's, it's, it's very much a, a colonial approach to planning. Next slide, please. So I just want to reflect that that foundation of the Bartholomew plan is, is still reflected largely in our land use and our zoning. And so if you look at the light gray areas, the large swaths of um, essentially our detached residential areas. So on our, what used to be called single family um, can now include a duplex, a laneway house, and a secondary suite, but we still have large areas of the city that are very much low density detached housing. Next, please. So um, Vancouver is very much um, a city of neighborhoods, and the map on the left shows the 22 uh, neighborhoods or local areas in Vancouver that were really part of uh, planning in the 1960s and going forward. And when we look at how growth has occurred um, in the last uh, 30 years in Vancouver, you'll see that high growth has happened certainly in the downtown and central area of the city, not surprisingly, but uh, major, major growth. And a lot of growth in the eastern um, and southern part of the city, um, whereas neighborhoods, a number of large neighborhoods on the west side 
have not been growing quickly and in fact in the last census are declining uh, in population and hollowing out. Next please. Um, so it's no surprise to um, this group that um, affordable housing and the housing crisis is really our, our number one challenge. And Amanda highlighted this, but in Vancouver, uh, we are one of the least affordable cities in the world and the gap between incomes and housing price are highly unmatched and have um, really um, separated. And so that you can see um, for example, detached home price compared to income has risen 136% versus 19%. Okay, next please. So it's interesting, um, I'm highlighting a bit about the, the low density residential areas, which are um, a lot of our school catchment areas. And when we look at what's been happening in the last 30 years, we see that there's been um, a huge changeover of housing stock. So approximately one in three houses has been a teardown um, and often replaced with uh, at times single family house and laneway house. And when we look at all of the change and development um, happening in the city, while we see many, many cranes in the air, it's, it's actually quite surprising that almost 60% of the built floor area in the last 25 years is in the low density residential areas. It's a lot of this replacement. Next, please. So again, when we look at um, our low density residential areas, um, they provide only 15% of the total um, dwelling units or houses um, on 52% of the land base. And so, Certainly in terms of efficiency and uh, diversity, they are quite low in that regard. And just the maps on the right show uh, different types of housing stock. So the, the green dots are showing purpose-built rental housing concentrated in the northern part of the city and also along arterials. And the map on the right is uh, social housing, non-market housing, co-op housing, again, concentrated primarily in the northern part of the city um, and in the eastern and somewhat southern part of the city. So you see this emerging pattern of neighborhoods um, in the central area and on the west side of the city that are low diversity, uh, low density, um, and just challenging in, from a planning perspective in some, some manners. Next, please. So that, that challenge is further shown in these maps that are really about um, access to daily needs. And so um, as part of the city's climate emergency action plan, uh, big move one is that we strive to have 90% of neighborhoods in the city within an easy walk or roll of daily needs by 2030. And these maps show that we have some big gaps in the city. Um, when we're looking at uh, neighborhoods that are complete and have access to daily needs, um, you see the, the light areas on the left are very much gaps where that access is more difficult. And on the, the map on the right hand is access to local serving retail. So those red hotspots are being really close to your local shops. And those blue areas are areas where you couldn't easily walk to get um, both daily needs and to, to retail. Next, please. So I'm sure of great interest to, to this group. This is um, some of VSB's um, data and it's showing uh, both the elementary schools on the left and the secondary schools on the right. And it is, it's um, school capacity utilization. So essentially it's looking at uh, the enrollment in each school or the headcount in relationship to the operational capacity. And, and in a nutshell, the dark purple areas are schools that have very high, um, high capacity utilization. And so they're, they're, fully, they're generally fully occupied whereas those blue and light colored uh, schools are areas where the, the head count may be low and the um, capacity 
maybe higher. And I'm sure we'll talk more about this in the breakout groups. So just some other aspects in looking at trends uh, in the city are job lands and, and part of an affordable, affordable living is certainly prosperous economy and access to, to good jobs. So we know that um, over 50% of the jobs are on only 10% of the land. And in particular, our industrial lands are in quite short supply. They're about 7% of the land base. And so while we don't anticipate we need to have jobs um, everywhere in the city, it makes sense for them to be concentrated in areas that the actual job lands in the city are fairly limited and precious. Next, please. Um, just another aspect when we look, especially at spatial equity, um, tree canopy is an interesting indicator uh, when we look at um, some of the ecological um, assets and, and health of the city. And when we look at tree canopy in the city, you can really see uh, there's much greater tree, ca tree canopy on the west side of the city. And there's some pretty significant gaps in tree canopy on the east side. And some of that is due to species of street trees, et cetera. But um, just a really important um, aspect for ecological health, um, but also just well being and livability of neighborhoods. Next, please. So I just have a few more uh, maps and, and factoids to, to kind of get you thinking. But um, when we look at our road space in the city, we see that over 80% of um, our road right of ways are dedicated to private automobiles and vehicles, including parking. And it's really the least efficient way of moving people around in the city when we compare it to um, transit, both rapid transit, um, bus, and um, active forms of transportation. And so walking and cycling make up about 35% of our mode use, and yet our road space is only 17%. Um, and I just want to comment that during the pandemic, we've really reallocated road space for outdoor patios, for greenways and movement. And we really think this is a way of the future going forward. So I'll just um, pretty much wrap up this section and hand it back to Amanda. Um, just a last uh, note, when we look at where we've been focusing community planning, so for example, the Camby Corridor Plan, the Marple Plan, West End, et cetera, the gold areas in the city are where we've undertaken um, long range community planning and detailed planning. And when we look at that in relationship to some of our growth areas, um, we see there are areas that really probably need uh, much more planning and a citywide plan is, is part of our rationale for, for doing this now. Um, and then I think I've just got one more, if we can go to the last slide. So when we um, pull together our existing policies or long range policies and plans um, in a high level um, land use plan, uh, or concept, we get a map that looks like this. And I think what we're really finding in analyzing um, our current land use and, and what we have in policy is that we still have these um, kind of monochromatic low density neighborhoods that aren't complete and um, aren't as vibrant and mixed of use as we probably think we need for uh, the future in looking out to 2050 and beyond, which is the horizon of the Vancouver plan. So I'm going to hand it back to Amanda, who's just going to touch on engagement before we um, come back in plenary. Thanks. Yeah, and we'll open it up to you in just a moment. So, you know, going back to where, you know, it probably feels like we've been at this for a while, but we really only launched uh, late last year. And sadly, we were, we were on the eve of rolling out a fairly extensive community-based uh, engagement effort. And that we were at council on a Friday, I believe, and then by the Monday, um, all engagement. And as we know, uh, our lives change very much. So we've had to kind of pivot and keep working on that. But these goals, we've been able to learn a lot through the work that we were able to conduct. And you know, we're moving from these high-level goals, in, in many ways, very aspirational, but we're kind of using uh, technical analysis, 
ongoing policy review and all the things we've learned to sort of push these into more specific big moves, focused moves, going from these big 10 to smaller kind of more focused group of moves. Um, we also wanted, you know, speaking about our commitment to equity, for those of you who are connected to neighborhood houses, as many of you are, um, you know, we've been working with nine neighborhood houses and really um, doing a new, piloting a new way of working where we're piloting a way to empower local folks to lead the conversation and really with a focus on, um, on youth, on low income residents, uh, folks who are new to Canada, seniors and single parent families. So again, another part of our commitment. And Stina Hansen's here tonight. She's an incredibly busy uh, youth and child and youth planner. Um, you know, and she, you know, she's here to facilitate, but you know, we may have some questions for her about the work, she's ongoing work that she's doing with teachers, students and youth hubs. And if you're looking for any of very detailed work that, that she's doing or ongoing work, um, you can go to vancouverplan.ca and we're going to give you some information about a youth survey that's currently in the field and you have till the 31st. But also, you know, really wanting to highlight the fact that COV and VSB more than ever um, are working really closely together. So whether it's our city manager, acting city manager and your superintendent, um, there's a very recent uh, letter of memorandum on data sharing. And I know for a fact that Susan Haid is often working with your teams at the VSB around the long range plan and how we harmonize and work together. And, you know, and then finally, we see um, parents as absolutely critical in this conversation. Um, so, you know, we came to you very early in the process and we're back again at an early next phase. And we see this as absolutely critical to us learning forward. So this meeting is one of a handful of, of critical groups with what we're calling neighborhood leaders. Um, we met with folks who are staff and volunteers from neighborhood houses um, and residents associations a few weeks ago. This is a, a critical meeting for us in moving forward. And we're also going to be meeting with the um, members of boards of the community center associations as well. So folks we see as real leaders at a neighborhood level. Finally, you know, a couple just opportunities. We're gonna talk more about this, but our teams are leading um, asset uh, based workshops or through a kind of online lens. So it's a new way of doing it, but we're using maps and walking people through choosing spaces and places that are important to them. So we've got a couple coming up and we really encourage you to take them and also to get the word out to um, your parent advisory. So we're going to give you again more information about that at the end of the evening. So just finally, really wanted to reiterate that we've really been listening to what you said in the first phase listening all along, but some of the things we want to check in with you about are, you know, we know that absolutely having schools where people live or want to live is absolutely critical. You know, we're very excited to see the recent announcement of the new school that's going to be coming to the Olympic Village, and we know how important that is and a big piece of work for, for DPAC. Um, schools that have spaces for the way students learn and communities engage. So how are schools designed? We're talking about capacity utilization and head counts. How do those, how does that work for you? And how does that work also with community, other uses like childcare, um, like other community um, and, and ways of sharing spaces? Um, on affordability and the equity gap, you know, we had some really powerful conversations with members of your advisories uh, last year um, where people were talking about how the cost of living in the city was really impeding their families and the families of others uh, from, from participating fully in school life. And then finally, you know, the citywide planning that really takes existing schools and their condition into account and plans long range coordinating how we're growing, how that's working with the current school inventory. You know, we know that these are, you know, that the long range plan is critical to you. So we're really more critically trying to align that. So want to take a chance now to open this up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And what I'm going to try to do is take uh, as many questions as we can get to uh, before eight o'clock before we go into our small breakouts. And what I would ask is if you could just uh, raise your hand and I'll keep a running list. Additionally, uh, if, you, if you're not getting my attention, you can put your, put, please just let us know, comment uh, in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that. So I'm gonna open it up and really want to just see if there are things you'd like clarified, uh, any comments before we go into a more focused conversation. So over to you. Scanning, scanning. I see some familiar faces. Leona, please Hi. go ahead. Hi, everybody. My name is Leona Brown. I'm Indigenous and 
my kids go to Queen Alexander School in Gladstone. So I think my, my part here is that I really want to keep a focus on Indigenous people and looking at this planning, <clears throat> you know, I'm just, I'm just trying not to like be too anxious about what I'm seeing. Like a, the plan from 1929 on the West End shows like a lot of, you know, taking care of the West End and Point Grey area. And it's still represented like such a great place to be, but why is that? It's because it's rich and wealthy people there. I mean, one of the, the big things about that and, and the expansion of our transit to help students go to UBC is that they won't allow um, the trans, the SkyTrain to go through that area where it would be so much easier if the train would go directly there for many people instead it stops at Arbutus and uh, there's just a few things like on here that I just see conflicting so much with Indigenous belief and the outline, the outlining areas and <clears throat> when you're looking at the map you see you know blank spaces and um, and where is that it's in the poor area the east end where where all these housings are um, I mean, I live in social housing and, it, it, and it's not that fantastic. Like when I look at that view of the map, um, it's, it's just like heartbreaking. Like we're just left here to die, I feel like. <laughs> and like there's no care of expansion around us and how we can navigate through our communities easily. And I can go on to bike lanes too. It's such a headache, but um, I think it's important to really important to reach out to more Indigenous families to have the, our input and in, in how we can stay here. I mean, we just fought a 12 school closure and, and now we're trying to fight like expansion in the city and change. Like so many of us say that the city is getting worse and who, who is we? It's families. Families are feeling like it's getting worse because the downtown core is going up. It's not going out. And who is in those those people going up? It's single people. It's you know foreign people that that come here to to go to school or whatever, or have a better job. But it it doesn't like accommodate families. None of this does. And I'm on I'm on several boards or several projects right now, especially with the parks board about trying to make it a greener space and make it a more you know, indigenous space because we're really getting lost in the shuffle here, getting lost so badly. And like you talk about the tree canopies and you look on the map and where is all the tree canopy at? It's on the West End because the West End people don't want their, their single housing units. You know, they don't want that expansion there, but it's okay to have it done on the, the, the East side here, right? Mm -hmm. And like, Part of the, my avocation is like having the tree canopy and more tree growth to look after the lands that we're on. Mm -hmm. There's just so much input. We need to figure out more ways to get to these, these people in the schools, the indigenous people, these indigenous families and have our views accounted for. Like how many indigenous people are here right now? Mm -hmm. Like there's very little. Like I would have expected a lot of people to come here and talk, but again, that goes back to because we're low income, because we're poor, we're busy, we have families, and then there's very little access to internet and, and knowledge to what is actually going on here. I just I wanted to... Very important points, and I'm not going to try to answer all of them. We do have work that's happening and um, an Indigenous a program is a core part of this but if you're not hearing about it then we need to really take that into account and I really appreciate your comments and you know we will be following up but I think it's you know we we, we critically believe this what you're saying is the case and 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 we'll we'll keep following up Susan I'm going to try and open it up to a few more questions so um, because we have limited time but if you've got a few uh, responses okay. that's great Sure. I, I just really want to thank you, Leona, uh, for your voice and what you're saying um, resonates really strongly with the Vancouver plan team. And I like Amanda, I don't think we have uh, an answer. It's it's really part of the challenge. And the maps that you saw um, are identifying issues that you voiced so beautifully that we need to 
look at how we can address them and improve um, the situation as part of the Vancouver plan. I, I did want to mention that we've been um, really fortunate to um, establish partnership agreements with each of uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh um, and are providing funding capacity for each nation to participate as, as, with their communities in the Vancouver plan, as well as urban indigenous communities through the um, uh, MVAC committee of council. And so again, it's not, uh, it's not a solution to what you're saying, but it is um, part of, uh, part of a opportunity to really engage. Um, we have also, um, Susan, Actually, you know what? Sorry, gonna, I just uh, sure, Amanda. I'm just to get okay. Questions yeah, out I'll just finish. Uh, as many great, people as possible um, tonight. Great, Amanda. I'll just finish my sentence in indicating that we're also really lucky to have um, a member from Musqueam as part of our planning team and cross-departmental uh, Indigenous staff. So thanks so much. Thanks, Susan. And sorry to cut you off. I just really want to make sure we can get as many folks in. So I have speakers list. I have Vic Tana, I have David Schaub, I have Vicky Scully, and I also know that Gord Lau uh, wanted to uh, flag and Lindsay Popes as well. So I'm going to go very quickly. I'm going to ask if you could kind of keep your comments short. And if we can't answer the question, we will commit to coming back to you to respond. So Vic, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I think the big thing for the city is something that I call purposeful density. So more planned densification. We know we need densification, but less ad hoc spot rezonings. And I think the city wide plan and the Vancouver plan is going to get us there. So that's the vision and the hope. And then how we do this is we need it to be in balance with amenities and that includes schools. So densify areas where amenities and schools exist um, and then build amenities and school space where there is too much current density. So I think that's the kind of balance that we need to look at the city to grow up in. Um, an example would be to upzone FSR for micro developments on single family. So easy 50 feet and 66 feet townhouse assemblies in areas where there's amenities, there's school space and there's park space and there's community center space. That would be fantastic. Thank and then you. I think the other thing is to create a, the city needs to create and protect tenants. So a nonprofit um, rental society should be registering all tenants across the city. And then that way, the future demo evictions that are going to take place, the tenants that are registered have dibs on those. Thank you, Vic. I'm going to ask you to, um, I'm going to just let everyone know that you're going to have about 30 to 40 minutes for comments um, uh, in your breakouts. And we're seeking this, just this type of these ideas. So just wanting to see if we can fit in a few more questions. And if you've got clarifications or questions you'd like answered about what you've heard, that would be great uh, to do right now. Okay, so I'm going to turn over to David next. David Chow. Hello. So <clears throat> one thing that we've been seeing with the Vancouver School Board is debates about things like ideal school sizes. And I wonder sort of how does items like that or possibly more important things like ideal catchment sizes impact city planning and more generally, how does the city of Vancouver really mesh their plans and their projections with the Vancouver School Board? That's great. Now I wonder if Susan's got a high level response to that. And I wanted to also let you know that we're gonna capture these questions and reflect them back in our notes. So, but Susan, is there anything that you'd like to respond quickly in terms of David's uh, question? Um, just, I think our data sharing agreement and also our coordination, that is much of the work that's underway now and ahead in terms of our long range plans, typically going out longer than um, the long range facilities plan. Um, but we're, we're definitely working on that and uh, aligning our different uh, projection 
uh, methodologies. But I, I would say it's it's really part of the work ahead. Thank you, David. Okay, thanks, um, Vicki Scully, and then we're going to go to Lindsay Popes. Vicki, go ahead. And hello. I thank you very much for your time tonight and absolute um, shout out for amazing maps. It, it always a picture speaks louder than words. Um, I have one point to get to about partnering between uh, VSB and the city of Vancouver, um, but I just want to echo the first speaker's, I think Vic's comment about um, putting population where amenities already are. I think that's a quick hit in a way of adding families and um, some density into neighborhoods with good schools, lots of parks, beaches, et cetera. I have two kids in kindergarten and grade four and they will be the residents in 2050. Um, I think there's an amazing opportunity to enhance the curriculum from a K to 12 um, basis by putting planning right in the schools, looking at how we could resource VSB with um, teaching kits, curriculum guides, et cetera, that allow all kids to be not only contributing to the plan, but also learning these critical planning skills. Everything that you guys do is the skill of tomorrow and our children are, are not necessarily getting that kind of education and you could be a real path setter here. Thanks, Vicki. That's great. And I think we're going to hear there is some work that's that's that we are working with VSB. And I might ask Stina if you've got anything you wanted to um, share with Vicki and with the others in terms of your work right now on the curriculum side. Yeah, we we worked in partnership with uh, the Society for Children and Youth, City Hive, and Urbanarium, and we'll be launching uh, a program that that builds on curriculum outcomes and guides from K to twelve. Uh, hopefully after spring break. So we've got some uh, meetings with some really excited teachers that are gonna be beta testing the stuff as it goes out um, initially. And we'll also be building that work through the fall as well. So through the choices work um, into, the, uh, into the next term. I mean, right now we've had uh, probably almost 400 touch points with, with kids uh, during this phase and we're hoping to just continue to build that. Uh, we'll be offering a, a citywide a digital charrette uh, for students in both elementary and high school uh, in, in April and May. And so, yeah, look for, for more opportunities to, uh, to connect with this program. And yes, we'll be offering stuff uh, through the classroom um, as well. If you're looking for more information, vancouverplan.ca, if you look for the young planners section, uh, for those of you who might be looking for some fun stuff to do with your, your kids at home right now. So, okay, so I'm gonna go uh, Lindsay Popes. I think you were next on the speakers list. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Um... Representative from Florence Nightingale Elementary. Uh, not to put you on the spot, Susan, but to follow up on David's question around the alignment of projections. I just wanna say this has like real world applications for those of us who are deeply affected, hopefully in the short term by the long range facilities plan. Um, and I would say that it seems that the numbers between what the school board is presenting and what you guys may be projecting are quite different. And if you could offer any timeline around that greater harmonization, that would be really helpful to understand um, because they're going ahead with plans that deeply impact communities. And I don't know that uh, the schools that are affected by that feel confident in their numbers. Yeah, thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, and I, I'd certainly welcome, um, I know Jim DeHoop is here as well to, to chime in or um, we could certainly talk in the, uh, the breakout groups, but in terms of um, our work on the Vancouver plan, um, we're also aligning with the regional growth strategy. So we anticipate having our, um, I guess our, our growth framework um, done um, through a consultative process um, between now and, and the fall approximately uh, to develop the draft plan. And so we're working now with VSB, um, you know, very much at what are our current policies and growth areas? Um, you know, what are um, VSB's projections? What are the cities? Part of the challenge is, is also trying to figure out, um, you know, how growth affects, um, how it relates to housing type and where families um, go. And that, that's changing. So, you know, I would certainly say there's, 
Well, no, I, I just mean that families are living um, in a, and I'm, I'm saying this as, as something we need to, to change. For example, what's happened downtown and cross town mm -hmm. and, and just huge families. So mm -hmm. um, you'll see more as part of the consultation, I would say in the next um, six months at different points to the draft plan. Thanks, Susan and Lindsay. I'm going to I'm going to try it one more. Gord, I'm sorry, I skipped over you. So Gord, if you could get the last question in and then we will take a five minute break and then we'll be going into breakout. So sure. Gord, please go ahead. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. So uh, I, I guess I, I mean, it was just a comment or a question on one of the last slides. Uh, I could phrase it either way. Uh, one of the slides where you said, you know, some of the priorities or what you heard were schools where kids live and will uh, and would like to live schools that have spaces for learning that 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 slide. Um, yeah. I think one of the other things that, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming that it's something that you heard. And, and certainly we hear it all the time. Oh, yes early messages that you've heard from school communities. Um, one thing that I thought that, you know, belonged here um, would be childcare, right? I mean, yeah. uh, schools, schools with childcare nearby um, and that you can actually coordinate with are such a, uh, so important to parents. Uh, and so I, I would just say that that's one thing that I hear all the time, that we hear all the time, especially obviously at the younger levels, right? Um, if you don't have childcare, you might not be able to go. You have to. You might have to go to a school where there is go to school close to childcare. It, it, it definitely happens. Thank so, you so th much, th and absolutely. And I think that's an omission on our part because that is certainly something we hear across the board, not only from parents but you know from a lot of different folks. So, look, um, I'm going to like give uh, take encourage everyone to do whatever you need to do in the next five minutes, and then we're going to be. Um, zapping you into uh, breakout rooms and facilitated by the current staff here. And then we're really wanting to, you know, I think to our my earlier comment, what are the big ideas or solutions that you feel like through your knowledge, your uh, work in community with your school um, and the parents you work with are ways we can advance um, these goals and address some of these uh, critical challenges that we've identified. So. Hey, Amanda. Yes, hi. And I hope I think everybody's back now. I'm just going to call up the, uh, the slideshow. And that was a pretty awesome conversation. So I hope you've all had a chance to, you know, really have a chance to kind of dig into some of the, these issues in more detail. We're just going to close out. I'm going to ask my colleagues who are facilitating if they could do a really couple of high level summary points on some of the big uh, ideas that emerged. And I just also want to um, just let people know that we are have captured our notes and we're going to make sure that we reflect those back in the next few weeks and captured your questions where we haven't been able to answer them. But I'm gonna take the next 10 minutes just for that big, that big report back, those big ideas. So um, maybe Susan, can I put you on the spot and ask you to go first? Sure, thanks, Amanda. Um, we had an amazing discussion. Um, just really quickly, we had uh, Janet, Scott, David, Adrian, Leah, Jim, Ishi, uh, Denise, uh, Catherine, and myself. Hopefully, I captured everyone. Um, really had a lot of personal life experience as, um, as parents um, uh, trying to thrive in the school. And I would say, overall, um, a really common theme um, that was actually named as, as sort of a big move is to make the city, the, make the whole city available for families. And that really meant um, ensuring that we have great um, affordable and really livable housing for families everywhere. Um, you know, in particular, affordable three bedroom housing, a lot of reflection that it's impossible to find, it's a unicorn to find a great th affordable three bedroom uh, place to rent. So there was a lot of emphasis on affordability, on rental, um, and just really ensuring families have access to great neighborhoods, focusing on neighborhoods that have um, amenities and, and parks and services and looking at ways to densify, to make them more equitable and complete. Um, I think also, um, trying to, yeah, this isn't quite the right words, but take the, the profit out of um, 
housing or housing as a commodity and try to put that more in the hands of people who live and work in the in the city. So tools to um, provide more um, non market more co op housing, more opportunities for uh, people to get together and densify on multiple units um, in neighborhoods. So there was much uh, deeper conversation and really experience. I, I think the other one that I wanted to hit on as well is with the um, change and development happening in the city, we're seeing a real pattern of the amenities coming later and they need to be there as you know the density and people arrive. So a bit of a mismatch. Thank so you, that, That's in, that sounds like an awesome, a really interesting conversation. Um, I'm gonna turn to, um, Stina Hansen now to give a high level couple of the key, the big findings or big learnings from the session you were in. Yeah, so so I had uh, Michael, Krista, Alan, Linda, Glenn, um, and Selena. And again, just a really interesting um, discussion um, really about, again, the need for, for continued collaboration uh, between the city and VSB um, in just looking through you know, different ways the development could be focused, you know, prioritizing areas where there are schools already, um, looking at, at the need to bring uh, schools online, um, you know, much faster in areas that are currently being developed. And also then the focus on just um, increasing and expanding childcare spaces across the city, um, looking at, at the model, kind of like the Strathcona model, um, which reflects input that we've heard from actual kids um, around the connection of community centers to schools. So both in terms of childcare programming um, opportunities uh, for youth as well. Um, and, and I think just, yeah, some discussion around sort of rental versus ownership, you know, what some clarification around what the goals actually mean um, and how they could, they could keep moving uh, forward. Um, and again, the, the sort of discussion about trade-offs between you know, what type of housing do we prioritize and what do we focus on and, you know, what do the goals, again, mean and how they are uh, actioned. And we also got some, uh, some, some economics reading uh, passed, passed along to us. Uh, so uh, good economics for hard times um, and the expendables. And so uh, I, have, I have some reading to do. Um, I think the whole group uh, has some reading to do as well. That's a bonus, that sounds great. Um, Catherine, can I ask you to jump in next, please? Uh, I was actually in Susan's group. Oh, okay. So, Bev. Yeah. Uh, yes, Bev thanks, White. Amanda. Um, so, we were having a great discussion, lots and lots of ideas, and I think there might be some more to come still. <laughs> um, one of the uh, key concepts was around making um, schools sort of mixed use hubs, recognizing that they are. Um, you know, really valued in, in the neighborhood and that they can be more than sort of just a school. Um, the auditoriums can be rented, um, sort of get nonprofits involved. And um, the Britannia example came up as this kind of uh, partnership approach. And the idea of um, really that need for a team-based approach, um, it was mentioned that the city, VSB and the Ministry of um, Education all needing to kind of come together to the table. Um, there was also discussion around housing and how sort of um, housing forms that are, um, you know, complete with communal courtyards and green spaces and maybe five stories sort of um, are, are good for, for families. Um, and we had uh, also the idea that all neighbourhoods should be taking a share of the Big Ten goals um, and finding channels to implement. So there's lots more. I've got several pages of notes and I'll report them back to the team. Thank That's you. great, thanks. And I'll do, I'll, I'll just do a quick one too. Um, I almost feel the, the burden of trying to reflect the richness of this back, but you know, I think we were really challenged to think about um, who's at the table. Um, Leona set the stage for that conversation in the plenary group. And we talked about the critical importance of accessibility to all folks and parents, even to these types of conversations. Um, again, childcare came up. Um, housing uh, affordability and access to, uh, you know, affordable housing. But there were some big ideas that I want to share. Um, making schools hubs of community work very much in the mixed use model, co-locating different services and making them real. In many ways, they already are the beating heart, but really finding ways to locate 
all sorts of um, services and opportunities there. Um, you know, real calls to action around um, the long range, our long range purpose, and you know, real um, support for this for long range planning, and really um, challenging us and the VSB to use that thinking to look at this, the futures of the school. So for everything from the seismic upgrading to addressing closures to doing taking that long range thinking that both uh, um, folks are doing and finding ways to connect that meaningfully. Um, a call to action around ensuring that density and services are uh, located throughout the city, addressing some of the um, asymmetry that we saw in some of those maps. Um, you know, uh, really some specific quick starts around uh, more rental housing um, and support accessibility supports, but also um, making sure the city uh, renews co-op leases for existing housing as well. So lots, lots of great insight. And, um, you know, again, a very strong emphasis on addressing school safety and closures as well. It came through strongly. So Thank you, everyone. Some really, um, you know, both naming issues, but also really thinking through opportunities and some creative opportunities for, for moving forward. So we're going to start closing this out. I want to just thank you all for the uh, fantastic contributions you've made. Um, we're going to do um, in the chat, uh, we just like to ask you a wrap up question. Um, you know, your ideas and how we can engage you moving forward. This is our second meeting with you during this process. And as Susan said, we intend to come back. Um, we'd also like to know how useful this was to you. Um, and we want to make sure that we're constantly improving how we connect with you in these sort of challenging times. Um, we just wanted to highlight one, a few more ways that you can stay involved and just again, um, reiterate how we'd like to come back to you. So you can find out uh, what we're working on at vancouverplan.ca. Um, that's the project website. And if you'd like to email us, if you have a thought, I know many of you, we didn't get everything down tonight. We couldn't fit every comment in, but planning together at vancouver.ca, please send us your comments, thoughts, um, anything you'd like us to include. Um, wanted to really highlight uh, Stina is leading, as we said, the child and youth engagement, and we wanted to make sure that um, that the youth survey is open till March 31st. Stina, is that not correct? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Nope, it's it's open till March 31st, uh, but the the website, um, the the actual link, I'll, I'll put in the chat. Um, Youngplanners.ca is is I is I don't think us. No, I think it's vancouverplan.ca. Yeah. Vancouverplan.ca is where you're going to find uh, that. Yeah. So yeah. that's the place to go to get that survey. So we would love for you to be able to send that out um, within your families or school communities as well. Um, additionally, um, you know, we just want to reiterate that we're going to capture the notes from, from tonight. And two weeks from now, we'd like to send those out to you. Um, we'd also like to just encourage you to have a look um, at the other opportunities to, to participate in this process. We have a lot of forthcoming workshops um, that are looking at what exists, what the opportunities and assets are in your neighborhoods and much more coming ahead. So vancouverplan.ca is a good place to start. And we'll be sending out a, a, a note to all of you with some of this all captured as well and some specific links. So we'll make sure you get the right link to uh, the youth survey as well. So um, just wanted to say, you know, a hearty thank you uh, for spending two hours, spring break, Wednesday night. There's so many other things you, you could be doing. Um, I hope you couldn't hear my cat meowing in the background, but she was going crazy tonight. But thank you all. And, um, you know, just thanks again for your participation. If you had any questions or anything you wanted to add in the chat, um, we'll sort of stay open for a few minutes here so we can make sure we can capture that as well. Thank you. Yeah, just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, amazing dialogue tonight. And uh, I see a few questions in the chat that um, we will circulate the, the slides and also the, the meeting notes as Amanda mentioned in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we would love as well if you could um, just share with your networks um, as leaders of, of school communities um, with your PACs. Um, we'd really like to get a, a network of, of parents and families involved in this process as we go forward. So um, I think just fantastic dialogue and thank you so much.
Thanks, everyone. So we'll um, we'll bid you good night. And again, if you want to add any more comments um, in the chat right now, we'll be capturing that before we go. Thanks again.